In the previous videos, we've seen how Mark borrowed from the Greek and Roman myths of his day in order to provide some of the details for his story. Now, let's look at another literary input for not only Mark's story, but the other three Gospels as well. Before any Gospels existed, but not long after the idea emerged that the Jewish God in fact had a son, Christians had been searching for the details about this new Son of God by digging through the Jewish Scriptures, what we now commonly call the Old Testament. We know that many of the passages were believed to be prophetic, God speaking through the prophets of old about His Son, but hiding that information from mankind until He started revealing it sometime around the turn of the Common Era. This method of reinterpreting the old passages in light of new ideas, such as a Son of God or Messiah figure, was known as Pesher. It was also known as Midrash. Pesher, or the plural form Pesherim, was a way to reinterpret the Old Testament, to try and make sense of it in more modern times, as well as to excavate God's hidden message, to which the common man was not privy. There was a high level, more literal understanding, and then the lower level, more esoteric and hidden understanding. But did some of the Gospel authors go a bit too far in their peshering and midrashing and begin pulling pieces of verses out of context and weaving fictional details into the stories? Did they also misinterpret the Hebrew Scriptures in the process? This video will comprise mostly text as it will be necessary to compare the Gospels with the Hebrew Scriptures, but hopefully what you learn or maybe brush up on will be well worth the strain on your eyes. According to Mark, while Jesus hung dying on the cross, Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But isn't it more likely that Mark simply put the first line of Psalms 22.1 into Jesus' mouth? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Psalms 22, in particular, became viewed as a prophetic passage about the suffering Jesus. But Mark has Jesus actually speaking part of the passage verbatim as Jesus hangs dying on the cross. Now let's look at an example from Matthew. If we only had Matthew's version, and we didn't even have the Old Testament to compare it with, we'd likely have believed him when he wrote that someone in the crowd at Jesus' crucifixion yelled, He trusts in God! Let God rescue him now, if he delights in him! But, isn't it more likely that Matthew, set on improving Mark's version and supplying more prophecies, simply followed Mark's lead and copied Psalms 22.8 and put the verse almost verbatim into the mouth of Jesus' heckler? He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And does it really count as a prophecy fulfillment if Matthew was unable to read the scriptures in Hebrew, but has to rely on the Greek translation known as the Septuagint? The passage as translated from the Tanakh reads, One should cast his trust upon the Lord, and he will rescue him. He will save him because he delights in him. This is much different than the harsh, accusing Septuagint version. He hoped in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him save him because he takes pleasure in him. We can clearly see that Matthew could not read the Jewish scriptures in their native Hebrew. He had to rely on the Greek Septuagint as his Old Testament source. This will come back to bite Matthew more than once, as we'll see later in this video. Let's look at another example. When Jesus' disciples asked him if he was the Messiah, Jesus answered by telling them to go tell John the Baptist that he was, in fact, the Messiah. Jesus then goes on to enumerate the kinds of miracles he had performed, which were signs that proved he was the one. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. 
The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Was Matthew recording exactly what Jesus said, or was he simply lifting phrases from the book of Isaiah and placing them into Jesus' mouth? Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart. Thy dead shall live, my dead bodies shall arise. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Now, remember that claim I made that Matthew's reliance upon the Septuagint would come back to haunt him? In Matthew, Jesus tells his disciples to go find a donkey and its colt and bring them both back to him so he could ride them both into Jerusalem, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. The idea of Jesus straddling two donkeys at once, considering that they're probably at uneven heights since one of them is a colt, is really hard to imagine. But once we view Matthew's source, the reason Matthew made the blunder becomes crystal clear. Matthew was misreading a passage from Zechariah because, as I stated earlier, he apparently couldn't read the original Hebrew, and he had to rely on the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Sion! Proclaim it aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, the King is coming to thee, just and a Savior. He is meek and riding on an ass and a young foal. It's unfortunate that Matthew couldn't read the scriptures in their native language. It would have saved him a lot of post-mortem embarrassment. Here's how the Hebrew sounds in a modern translation such as the NASB. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The phrase about the colt is not in addition to, but it's actually a modifier to explain that the donkey the king would ride would specifically be a colt. This is known as a Hebrew parallelism, a form of restatement, a sort of poetic structure. It sometimes also adds further clarification. There is only one animal mentioned here. That Matthew had to rely on the Greek Septuagint instead of the actual Hebrew text is quite clear from this side-by-side -side comparison of the Septuagint Greek to Matthew's rendering. You can see that Matthew copies the Septuagint verbatim but leaves out a couple of phrases. This would not have happened if Matthew was copying from the Hebrew texts. Now, oddly enough, Mark, John, and Luke make another small blunder that Matthew also made all four Gospels refer to the donkey as a polon, or colt, a young foal. But the actual Hebrew word in Zechariah 9.9 carries no indication of age, only that the animal is an offspring of another. Without bogging down this whole issue, we can see the same setup in Genesis 49.11, a parallelism involving, oddly enough, two donkeys, which are in fact one donkey. Binding his foal, the Hebrew ayir, meaning offspring, but not necessarily a young offspring, unto the vine, and his ass's colt, colt here being an unnecessary translation because athon bin simply means the son of a she-donkey, not necessarily a young son of a she-donkey, unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. There is only one animal here, as we can clearly tell by the distinct parallelism. The man is binding one donkey, an offspring of a she-donkey, to a grapevine and washing his clothes in wine. The blood of grapes is just another phrase meaning wine. The binding and washing are simply repeated using slightly different wording, but there is only one washing going on here and only one donkey, 
and the Hebrew word ayir does not indicate youth at all, and as such there is not necessarily a cult involved. This is the same Hebrew word used in Zechariah 9.9, and once again, the Septuagint translators have erred, causing the evangelists to also err, as no one would ride an unbroken animal that was physically immature and not very strong. But again, the word ayir does not mean cult necessarily. The Septuagint translators made a tiny error and interpreted the two parallel Hebrew phrases as talking about two different animals, and they inserted the Greek word for and, which is chi, and that's almost always used to mean in addition to or as well as. And this caused Matthew to create the hilarious prophecy fulfillment of Jesus straddling two donkeys at the same time. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. Ouch! That's got to hurt those inner thigh muscles. Well, okay, so it's possible he sat cross-legged or even sideways, but the point is, since Matthew understood Zechariah 9.9 to mean two donkeys, he had to make Jesus ride two donkeys, or the prophecy wouldn't be fulfilled. Matthew then goes on to reference the passage explicitly, Zechariah 9.9, as proof that the prophecy had been fulfilled, and he explicitly uses the Greek word chi to denote two distinct donkeys. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on an ass, and on a colt, the foal of an ass. Incidentally, only Matthew made this blunder of misinterpreting Zechariah 9.9. Mark, Luke, and John interpret it correctly and have Jesus riding only one donkey. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And he said to them, go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And one last thing before we leave the triumphal entry scene. We see Mark depicting the crowd as welcoming Jesus with shouts of Hosanna in the highest, and blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Two interesting things come to mind here. The first is that again, the crowd is made to say something that Mark, or earlier tradition, actually found in the Old Testament. Hosanna, O Lord, blessed be he who enters in the name of the Lord. Praise him in the highest. Here is Mark's version again, and I'll point out a little problem with Mark's understanding. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Notice that Mark seems to believe that Hosanna means something akin to praise God or praise the Lord for he replaces the word for praise him in Psalms 148 verse 1 with the Hebrew term Hosanna. Unfortunately, Hosanna doesn't mean praise the Lord. It means save us or save us Lord. It is not a term of rejoicing. It is not a term of praise, but one of petition, a cry for help. Perhaps Mark accidentally confused Hosanna with the actual Hebrew from Psalms 148 verse 1, which is Halal Yah, or Praise Yahweh. You might recognize the sound of that. It's where we get the term Hallelujah. 